don't. Okay, point is, we're just like, we, we're wired for this. Like, we're just like in suspense. And then, but typically with chick flicks, you know, have you guys ever watched a chick flick and you turned it off and you're like, oh, my life is worthless. You know what I mean? And then what do you do? You grab a box of little Debbie's and you pop on another one, right? Like, have I not been hanging out with college women for a while? Um, because what we do is we think, okay, we don't have this perfect guy in our life. We don't have this fairy tale romance. I always say we don't have that awesome like music cue up behind us when we're like walking. You know, you know, you're leading somewhere and the music starts, and you're like, where's that music? I need it. You know what I mean? So you watch all this, or you listen to the love songs, or you, you know, whatever it is, and it leaves you feeling kind of empty. It leaves you feeling kind of worthless. And I, I noticed that a lot of my women in my life, the women that I was with, they were just kind of walking around feeling up about themselves. Because what happens? You watch, you know, three chick flicks in a row, and then like a guy walks by and you're like, him. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like you're remotely attracted to him and you're like, all this emotional energy is coming out on you right now. Right? So what do we do? We laugh, but first thing we do, we mentally stalk him. Okay, everyone giggles, what do you do? I do what you call the Christmas card test. You think about your last name, his first, your first name with his last name and how it looks, and then every baby name you've ever liked and how it sounds with his last name, right? And then you think about your first date and you, you start planning out your three proposal options. He can pick which one he wants, right? Like whichever he thinks is best. And you have your ring on Pinterest. It's all worked out. Don't even worry about it, right? You will give him the script. He will follow along. Guys are good at following along. It'll be great. Um, so then after you get tired of that, you Facebook stalk him. And as you're Facebook stalking him, you sit and watch one, uh, look through 1,455 pictures of him and his Uncle Bill on their fishing trip. And then you see him with his arm around some girl, and you're like, oh, that better be his sister. And you start judging him. My girls, one of my girls, I was like, you guys are pathetic. They were like looking at this guy's Facebook page, and they're trying to figure out his surroundings, and they're like, I think he's in the coffee shop. What was the time that he was there? Like, let's go to the coffee shop. You're sick. You're sick. Right? You guys are crazy. And they're like, well, I think he's still there. I'm like, oh my gosh, Facebook, right? Um, and then after we Facebook stop him, we start to text him. And then we start to call him. Okay, I'm losing this. I'm not gonna work, it's not gonna work out. And then we start calling him and flirting with him, and then we start physically stopping. Physically stalking him or getting physical with him, right? I call this the emoto coaster. And the reason why I call this the emoto coaster is because it's kind of like a roller coaster, except for if you guys ever, you know, pay $40 to get to an amusement park, you're waiting in line for four hours, like this could be epic, right? And then you get on the roller coaster, and it takes you upside down all around, gives you whiplash, and then the ride stops, and you get out and you throw up in front of everyone. And you're like, why did I ever think that was a good idea, right? Anyone ever been in a relationship like that? Okay, even married women, right? Do you remember that relationship? It was not good. Women, that's, I call it the emoto coaster because that's just naturally what kind of happens. Um, now, I'm a huge fan of Facebook, I'm a huge fan of Pinterest, I'm a huge fan of all of it, but the whole thing is, is kind of, how do we let it, my, my favorite I, emotions, right? Controlling and ordering your emotions. If you don't control your emotions, they will surely control you. And so, I love Facebook, I love Pinterest. I don't know what I did before text, right? Like, amazing stuff, but it's very, it's something we have to just be aware of because there are some potential traps. Here are some of the potential traps. Mental stalking is a one-way relationship. You're building the unknown, expectations can be high, and it can be creepy. Facebook stalking, you're getting into their personal life and making assumptions. Let them introduce themselves. Texting, it can be intimate, misinterpreted, you can rationalize things as no big deal. It can be addictive. Anybody ever been misinterpreted in a test? Mm -hmm. Woo, right? That's, that's a fun cleaning that up, right? Um, calling, staying up late, you reveal a lot about yourself. It can be addictive. No one there to hold you accountable and very private. Flirting, attention. You're trying to fill an insecurity. You're sending mixed messages. It can come across as fake. You want them to get to know the real you. We think guys don't, don't notice when we're, when we're flirting with them and being fake. They do. I think they told me anyway. So physically, you have to be around them. You don't have any fun without them. You start doing things just because they do. You change who you are to please them. Think about Runaway Bride and her eggs. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Run Runaway Bride. Every guy she's with, she says she likes her eggs the way that he does. And then there's a point in the movie where someone asks her how she likes her eggs, and she's like, I don't know. 
Like she totally lost herself. Do you know what I mean? Um, one point for Hollywood, they get one. All right? And then emotions are so strong, you start going to things just because they're there, and it's tempting to wrap yourself up in something for the wrong reasons. The physical stalking one, I think, really is, is a hard one for high school because typically if, if you feel all this pressure to date in high school, which we'll talk about that later, but there's all this pressure to date, and all of a sudden you start dating someone and you stop caring about what your goals and what it is that you want in your life and what you really have been you know, wanting, and you start changing and doing things just because your significant other wants you to. And I always say one of my biggest things is please don't pick your college based on a boyfriend or a mascot. All right, those are the two things. Um, because boyfriends and mascots are just not what your dreams are gonna be built upon four years later when you graduate. Everyone nods your head up and down if you know what I mean. Okay, good. So you have these potential traps. Now here's the deal. When guys use women, you know, we, I give these talks for guys too. I love that Monsignor is the only guy here because I love giving talks for the guys out here. Um, and then I love giving talks to a whole group of guys. I gave a talk to 500 guys at an all, all Catholic boys prep a couple weeks ago. It was awesome. It was so much fun. I have this picture of me in the middle of the gym and eight, like this big gym. And I'm in the middle and these two senior guys came up to ask me a question. And next thing I know, I see this flash go off in the corner. And I look at the flash and it was a woman taking a picture because almost the entire student body had circled all the way around me to hear my answer to these two guys. And I turned up and down, that's awesome, right? Um, they were infatuated with what I had to say. They felt like they were unlocking the secrets of women, right? Like it was awesome. Um, but when guys use women, you know, typically if something happens and a guy uses a woman with his, with his eyes, or physically, right? We all see that and we're like, what a jerk, right? But women use men emotionally all the time. And we think that they don't notice. Or we think that we're getting away with something, right? But here's the funny thing. Guys know that you're doing that, but it gets them what they want, right? So that's kind of the secret is, you know, we always say some people will use, some people say guys use love to get sex, and some women use sex to get love. But here's the problem. The word is not love, the word is use. Men will use women to get sex, and, men, and women will use sex to use the man to feel loved. Everyone nod your head up and down, you're following me. Is this, this is the story of our world, it's just going on and on and on and on and on and on and on, and no one just stands up and says, wait a minute, first of all, I don't, think, think about a time where either emotionally or physically you were used and you knew it. Think about a time where you emotionally or physically used someone and you knew it. Think about a time when you watched your best friend be physically or emotionally used and you knew it. Or think about a time that you watched your best friend use someone and you knew it. You feel the heaviness of that. It is so heavy, even in my own heart. You know what I mean? And so there's a cycle of use that's going on. And I feel like, we, you know, we don't talk about it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, let's just not deal with it because it's too big to deal with, right? And I want you guys to take to heart this quote. It's one of my favorites from Pope John Paul II. He said, a person should never be used as a means to an end. A person can never be used for your own pleasure. For the men, men cannot use women for their own sexual pleasure, ever. And for women, we can't use men to fill some insecurity or some type of hole in our heart or some type of, we don't want to be alone or the pressure to have a relationship, so I'll just date this guy. Like, you're using him. But none of us are women enough to come out and just say that, right? And so there's so many good relationships out there, but think about top ways men and women use one another. You cannot use someone to fill a hole in your heart that is made for God, to comfort you in some kind of insecurity you have to make you feel good about yourself and then drop them, to string him or her along because you don't want to feel alone or can't be happy without a dating relationship in your life. I know that that, that last one is hard. It's really hard. That was me in high school, right? I was, a, I was and am a perfectionistic people pleaser. First born, only girl, right? Like, I have it written all over me. And I fought since probably the day I was 11 years old trying to fight that, that I don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. But in my head, yes, I do. And so part of being perfect is having the perfect boyfriend, the perfect this, the perfect that. I was valedictorian. Like, it just was so much pressure. But it was even emotionally a lot of pressure. And no one put it on me except for myself. And I know that's how a lot of you guys feel, because I've 
heard it all over the country, right? We put all this pressure on ourselves, and we will do anything we, we can to get what we want, to get what we think we need. And if that includes using someone, then okay. And that's why I'm here, is because no one ever stood up in front of me and said, Sarah, like, you can't use people, ever. Practice now, because you're not going to use your husband in marriage, you're not going to use your children, you're not going to use your best friends. Like, girl, get it figured out now. That's exactly what I needed to hear. But I was just, like, subconsciously so wrapped up in it. You know what I mean? Like, that wasn't even, I never chose to use anyone, I just was going about my life. And so that's something that I really want you guys to look at. This is my favorite quote in addressing this. Love, this is from a priest friend of ours. Love, St. Thomas Aquinas said, is willing the good of other as other. Love is not primarily a feeling, though it can be accompanied by feeling. That's the confusion of our time. Confusing love's feeling with love itself. Love, actually, is a great act of the will. It's when I say, I desire your good, not for my sake, but for yours. To love is to break out of the black hole of the ego and say, my life is about you. I like that last part. To love is to break out of the black hole of the ego and say, my life is about you. How romantic is that? How beautiful is that? This is, this is a quote. One of my good friends is Father Robert Barron. He has the word on fire.org. He's the Catholicism Project guy. I don't know if you know him or not. One of the most phenomenal priests in the country. My husband studied under him for his doctorate. And Father Barron sent me this blog that he wrote. He's like, I think you're going to like this. I'm like, I think I'm going to put it on the slideshow. Um, it is phenomenal, right? Now, tell me, what is more romantic? The world's, the world's view of romance or this? Everyone just say this. And then let's go with which one is easier? The, lo the, the world's view or ours? Problem, right? Like... Effort. Dang it. Um, this is hard. Married women, this is hard. Yep. Is this hard? Yep. Okay, married women, is it worth it? Yes. Okay. Ooh, I love having teenagers and cool, cool older people. I love it. Um, so when you look at this definition, I want you to keep it so in your heart throughout this whole talk. Because it's all about the other person. It's all about the other person. It's, it's not, what well, can I, think about relationships. When you, when you guys go to date a guy, it's like, what is he going to do for me, right? Like, what can I, what can this guy do for me? What happens if we start looking at things like dating as, what can I do for this person? Instead of take, it's all about give. Hello people, that's marriage. It's not take, it's give a lot. And it's awesome. Then you have children, it's like, holy cow, right? I thought I was selfish, and then I got married, and I was like, very selfish. And then I had children who were like, scum of the earth. All right. <laughs> Excellent. Right? Um, that's how it was for me anyway. I was 22 when I had my first baby. And it was like, welcome to life. Right? And it was hard. It was hard to, you know, really love someone so much that you forfeit so much of what you used to do. Moms um, just, you know, a lot of you have been at it for 18 years. I've only been at it six. So I'm sure that I don't need to tell you guys that. But here's what I want to share with you about emotional virtue. This is the definition. 